Today we're going to take on the question, is quantum mechanics weird? And if it is weird, what makes it weird? Quantum physics simply refers to the study of the very small. It's the study of the universe on the smallest level. And what's been noticed is that on the smallest level is that things come in smallest amounts, smallest little bundles. And that's what quantum really means. A quantum is a smallest unit of something. Well, the quantum of cash would be here in Canada. It used to be the penny, but we've gotten rid of pennies, so our quantum of cash is now the nickel. But we don't find cash in any smaller amounts than a nickel. Quantum of a human population? Well, that would be a person. A quantum of charge? That would be that number 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. We don't find any charges in nature that are smaller than that. And the quantum of electromagnetic radiation? That would be the photon. So there's really nothing strange about the word quantum. Now, well before quantum mechanics was ever heard of, Thomas Young did an experiment. It's the famous double slit experiment. And he proved that light was a wave. Because only light can produce these interference patterns. Particles don't produce interference patterns. Only waves do. So Thomas Young showed that light was a wave. Now, about 100 years after the double slit experiment, Einstein came along and he explained this photoelectric effect. It was an effect where light was shone in on a metal and electrons would be emitted from the metal. But what he did is he showed that that was only possible if light was not behaving like a wave, if light were behaving like tiny little bundles of energy, behaving like particles. So we have two experiments, both of them giving very clear results, and yet they're contradictory. Who was right? Both were right. And we talk now about wave-particle duality. We talk about everything in the quantum world. Everything that's really small has a wave nature and a particle nature. And they coexist. So is it weird that both are right? Well, yes and no. We know that Electromagnetic radiation, that is light, it behaves like waves in some circumstances and like particles in other circumstances. And we're fairly used to that sort of idea. Your dad might act very differently at a gathering than he does at a party. And that might be a little bit awkward for us, but it's not really weird. We're used to that type of thing. In fact, this behavior is quite predictable. If our obstacle size is comparable to the wavelength, then we tend to see wave-like behavior. But if our obstacle size is much greater than our wavelength, then we tend to see particle behavior. So in the same way we can predict the way that dad's going to act at a party or a gathering, we can predict whether the electromagnetic radiation is going to act like a wave or a particle. Not so weird, I think. Now where I think all this thinking begins to get weird, where quantum mechanics begins to get weird, is when we start to think of particles, such as, say, electrons, and we think about the co consequences of them behaving like waves. And I'm going to let this really excellent Dr. Quantum animation illustrate this to you. The animation is from the movie What the Bleep Do We Know? And the narrator is physicist Dr. Fred Allen Wolf. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. 
this is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slip, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So. They decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply. So we end up with some really big, really deep questions. It starts with this question of how can a single electron that should only be able to pass through one slit or the other, how can that interfere with itself? And leads to even deeper questions. How can this probabilistic quantum world, how can that interface with this ordinary macroscopic world that we live in? How can we go from a world of pure probabilities to a world of actualities? Schrodinger proposed a problem that really highlights the difficulty in interfacing between this world of probability in mathematical waves and a macroscopic universe. In the problem, you've got some quantum mechanical event, radioactive decay. And let's say the half-life of a radioactive particle is, say, one hour. 
So that would mean there'd be a 50-50 chance of our radioactive particle decaying in a one hour time period. What you're going to do is place the cat in the box and then you're going to open the box in one hour. The question then becomes, okay, in the quantum world things can exist in a mixture of states. The electron can be in both slits at once, in one slit, in the other slit, in no slit at all. And our radioactive particle can exist in both states, having decayed and having not decayed. But in this particular example, what happens is the decay is going to trigger the release of a toxic gas. And that toxic gas would kill the cat. So if we've got a quantum state in a mixture between decayed and not decayed, will we also have a cat, a macroscopic object that's in a mixture between dead and alive? It creates a really deep problem. Now, Schrodinger dreamed up this cat thought experiment as a reaction to the Copenhagen interpretation. The Copenhagen interpretation was an interpretation of quantum mechanics that came out of a very famous physics conference that took place in Copenhagen. In the 1920s, in the infancy of quantum mechanics, after it had been shown that single electrons could produce an interference pattern, all the great physicists of the time met in Copenhagen. So we have Einstein, Bohr, Dirac, Wolfgang Pauli, Schrödinger, Heisenberg, Marie Curie, Louis de Broglie. All of them came for some very intense discussions. And Niels Bohr kind of dominated things. And for the most part, he wanted to stick to science. He didn't want to try to answer these deeper questions. He said that this mathematical wave stuff, it makes predictions. They can be verified by experiment. And let's drop it there. Let's not ask the deeper questions about the nature of our universe. In fact, well-known physicist David Merman summed up the Copenhagen interpretation as the shut-up-and-calculate interpretation. Despite the Copenhagen interpretation that came out of that conference, the physicists that were at that conference were deeply affected for the rest of their lives. And many of them attempted to answer these very deep questions. Schrodinger wrote essays called The Eye That Is God, The Mystic Vision, and The Oneness of Mind. Einstein wrote of the cosmic religious feeling. De Broglie wrote an essay called The Mechanism Demands a Mysticism. Planck wrote an essay called The Mystery of Our Being. And Wolfgang Pauli wrote an essay called Embracing the Rational and the Mystical. The four most common interpretations for the problem of the electron knowing the other slit is there are one, the Copenhagen interpretation, two, an interpretation where consciousness plays a special role in breaking down the wave function, a third where you've got a pilot wave function, and a fourth called the many worlds interpretation. In the Copenhagen interpretation, you've got this wave function which represents a mixture of probabilities, the probability of going through one slit, the probability of going through the other slit, the probability of going through no slit at all, etc. And when a measurement is made, that wave function breaks down so that something actually happens and the electron is in one slit or the other. Now many people, such as Dr. Freda Allen Wolf, believe that consciousness plays a much bigger role than that and that when we're talking about making a measurement we're becoming conscious of something and it's consciousness now that breaks down the wave function. And this gives a very different way in terms of how we look at the universe and our role in the universe. A third interpretation is what's called the pilot wave function. In the pilot wave function, the electrons are particles. However, there is this pilot wave function that, in a sense, knows everything that's happening in the universe. So when this electron goes through one of the slits, this pilot wave function always knows whether or not there's another slit over here. So it, in a sense, it's kind of a weird universal knowledge thing where everything knows about everything else. Now in the many worlds interpretation, what happens is every time there's a measurement made, an observation made, then the universe splits up. So that in the Schrodinger cat problem, when we open the door where the cat is enclosed, in one universe, the cat will be dead. And in the other universe, 
the cat will be alive. So it might seem a little bit ridiculous that we would have, well, so very many universes. However, recent developments in string theory have given credence to the idea of a multiverse. So that there's some pretty good evidence out there that is not just a single universe, it's a multiverse. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.